Welcome to Teaching That Counts, a podcast dedicated to the teaching and learning of mathematics. I'm honored that you have chosen to spend your time listening to the conversations between me and my guests. We discuss a lot of different topics from building thinking classrooms to creating a more equitable math class. You can find me online via our website, teachingthatcountspodcast.com, or on socials at Maestas Teach. Thank you again for joining me, and I hope you enjoy the pod. Welcome, everybody. This is the last episode in the first season of the podcast, Teaching That Counts. I'm so excited. This season has been just amazing talking to teachers and students and really focusing on building thinking classrooms. If you've been keeping up with us this season, we've gone through the book, Building Thinking Classrooms with some teachers. We went through each chapter, talked about the highs and lows and what's going on in the classroom as we started to implement each of these toolkits. And it's been, it's been pretty, a pretty amazing adventure, I guess you could say, over the last, uh, several months in the last school year. And, you know, uh, teachers had questions about things that were going on. They really enjoyed the vertical non-permanent surfaces. They really just, took a hold of each of these practices and started really experimenting and growing. And I know that, um, you know, if you've been listening to this season, you heard from some teachers and just how impressed I've been with the work that they've done and the conversations that we've had around mathematical teaching and learning using the Building Thinking Classrooms framework. So we've, we've had a lot of time to talk through all of those things. We've talked to some administrators. We talked to even some students. And this season has been awesome to start off this podcast. I am super excited for this episode for you guys to hear. We're capping off our whole first season of Building Thinking Classrooms discussions with the man himself, Peter Lilladal. I had a chance to talk to him and we recorded a podcast to end out this season wonderful, wonderful conversation. Um, got a lot of questions answered that I think teachers and admin had out there about learning intention, success criteria, about what do we do when we have students that need accommodations? How do we get them involved in the random groups and the boards? And then some great information on, on the grouping. I, you know, I always thought that, uh, groups of four were the best. And when I was teaching and then, uh, over the last year, three is the magic number and listening to Peter talk about why three and not only why three, but is there situations where three might not be the best? And he goes into that in detail. So I'm super excited for you guys to listen to this episode and cap off a wonderful season. And in my next episode, we'll talk about where we're going to go in season two. So enjoy the conversation with myself and Peter Lilladon. So with me today, hello, Mr. Um, Doc, is it doctor? It is doctor, but as my daughter says, not the kind that helps people. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I think I think uh, what you've done so far, I think it's helping a lot of people. So with me today on Teaching Accounts, uh, I'm so excited to talk to Dr. Peter Lilliedahl, and um, I hope I did that justice. <laughs> and uh, I... I have to say, I am I am so excited to talk to you about your book and really just talk to you about the changes that have been going on in my district, in the people that I've talked to, in the teachers and admin that have talked to, that have listened to my podcast. It really has, has been a game changer in the math community. And I know you've been all over the place the last two years. Um I gotta say, you've got to you have to put those uh, miles on the on the the air flights, right? Oh yeah. Last year I did 171 flights. This year so far I'm over 100. Wow, we're in August too. So yeah. I <laughs> that's that's crazy. Any uh any great places you've gone to? The restaurants, things that you've really oh, loved about different. Uh, like- yeah, I well, I've everywhere I go is great. There's always something to see, something to do. Got to spend some time in Chicago this summer, which is, it's not my first time in Chicago, but I, I really like Chicago. Got, I, I've been in, in the last 
three months, I've been in Oslo, Warsaw, uh, New York, Princeton, St. Louis, Little Rock, Chicago. Yeah. It just goes on and on. Kansas City, twice. Yeah, Seattle. You got to get that good barbecue at Kansas City. Oh, yeah. That, you know, that just goes to the to what you what your book has done in terms of the reach it's gotten in the last couple of years. And I know I listened to podcasts with you on on them. Um, I, I, I went to the Building Thinking Classrooms conference in yeah. Indianapolis. That's where I met you. Yeah. And uh, you talked about in the end, you talked about the stories and gathering stories. And so recently, I, I kind of wanted just to tell you this. I was on Facebook and a little memory popped up of my own class. Now I'm an instructional coach and podcaster. So um, I'm not in the classroom, but I am helping teachers. But I looked at my own classroom and it said 2014 on Facebook. And, it, and I took a picture of the whole classroom and the classroom is in groups with vertical non-permanent surfaces all over the classroom. And that was in 2014. And so when your book came out and I read it a couple of years ago, I was just like, wow, this is what I've been going towards my career in the last 10 years. So it was just just so amazing to kind of see some of that validation and then some of the things I could have done better. And now I think all I do is try to spread Building Thinking Classrooms. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, it. Um, so for the listeners out there, we've got, I've got a lot of admin. I've got board members, teachers, students, coaches that listen to the podcast. Can you just give a quick, what is a thinking classroom? Ah, well, if they're listening to the podcast, because I've been listening to your podcast too, they should know by now. Yeah, you know what? They should know what a thinking podcast <laughs> But if they're a first time <laughs> a thinking classroom. Um, a thinking classroom is a reaction. It's a reaction to a recognized and empirically proven reality that students spend a lot of time in their math classrooms not thinking. And this is a problem because if students aren't thinking, they're not learning. And building thinking classrooms is a reaction to that. It's uh it's it's the result of 15 years of research into how we can systematically and upend some of the normative structures of classrooms so that they become more conducive to thinking. Uh, a normative classroom does not value thinking. It doesn't support thinking. It doesn't encourage thinking. So <clears throat> what are the changes we need to make in our practice, in the way our classroom is laid out, where the students work, who they work with, what kinds of things they work on, how we launch the task, how we close an activity, all of these things can be restructured in such a way that thinking is prioritized, but thinking is also not only encouraged, but supported and valued. Uh, and that's what a thinking classroom is. What it looks like, as you just described, if you walk in, you'll see that students are working in random groups of three, standing at vertical whiteboards, and they're thinking, they're working through tasks that the teacher hasn't shown them how to do yet. Yeah, yeah. So it's noisy. It's loud. It's it's lots of engagement. It's busy, and and I think a lot of teachers they they ask that question: How do I get more engagement in math? Right. I think a lot of times some students, oh, math. I don't like math because it's boring, or you know, we just sit there kind of listen and take some notes. And how do we how do we increase the engagement? And I've seen that you just put them on their feet, and things change pretty quickly. Yep. But, Very quick. Yeah, but there, there are some other elements and practices that you have in your book that help support support those things, like the random groups and the groups of three. Yeah. How, how did you come about the groups of three? Because we've had the teachers that I've had on the podcast, we've just been discussing like three, but we're almost always done four. And yeah. so how did three become the magic number? Uh, it just showed up to be the magic number. So <clears throat> once we realized that strategic grouping and self-selected groupings weren't effective for getting students to think, we started experimenting with other grouping strategies. A random came out as number one. And within a few months of that coming out as number one, uh, it emerged pretty clearly that groups of three were optimal. Uh, it, it's just, it was it was observational at first, and then it was empirical later that yeah, groups of three were the best. <clears throat> when we have groups of three, we hear three voices. When we have groups of four, we hear three voices. When we have groups of five, we hear two voices. It just, 
it just wasn't working with groups of four. <clears throat> Why groups of three is optimal? That's another story. That took a long time to figure out. Huh. Right, that groups of three were optimal was quick. Why that took longer, and it it comes from something called complexity theory. So complexity theory says that um, in order for a group to be generative, it has to have a balance between redundancy and diversity. So redundancy are the things that every member of the group has in common. We need to have things in common in order to be able to start collaborating, right? So we need to have some common language, common notation, common knowledge. We need to have things in common that allow us to start to talk to each other. But if all we have is redundancy, then, then the group is no stronger than the individuals. Uh, the group also needs to have diversity. Diversity is what every member of the group brings to the group that's different. And what happens when the numbers get higher is that diversity goes up, that's good, but redundancy goes down, and that's bad. Mm. And when the numbers get smaller, the redundancy goes up, and that's good, but diversity goes down, that's bad. And we clearly see this. Like our research shows that groups of three are optimal. If you don't have a perfect multiple of three, go with, with a couple of groups of two. Don't go with a four. Uh, the problem with two is that they run out of ideas pretty quick. There just isn't enough diversity in that. So when we have some groups of two, we try to put the groups of two really close to each other so that they can start getting ideas from each other. And there's an irony in that. Because if I would have made a group of four to begin with, it would have been a dumpster fire. But if I made <laughs> two groups of two and put them close to each other, they will naturally start to collaborate, but in a way that everyone's voice is still heard. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I see that in the knowledge mobility in the classroom, because even if it's a group of two and they stop, they can look over and see another group and start talking to that other group yeah. about what they're doing or get some hints mm -hmm. to, to then move on. Um, yeah. Now, so, I should yeah. say groups of three were optimal in every setting except for one. I'll get to that. In a okay. Bit. Uh, there was also settings where groups of three were optimal, but we had to start with groups of two. So primary students, we had to start with groups of two because uh -huh. they don't yet know how to collaborate, right? They know, they're right. still playing in parallel. We need, to, we need to teach them how to collaborate in twos before we move to threes. And with vulnerable populations, if you're working mm. in some sort of a program, where uh, alternate ed or something like that, we found that groups of two were better to begin with. Groups of three are eventually better, but groups of two are better to begin with because those students don't yet know how to trust. Yeah. Um, the one setting where groups of two were better all the time was when our class sizes got really small. So if you have... Oh, that's interesting. The cutoff, the, yeah, the cutoff point was 15. People often ask me, so what class size does this work for? <laughs> and I think what they're asking is, what's the upper limit? And, yeah. and they're they're surprised by the answer. And that is that it works in every setting as long as you have more than 15 students. Below 15, it starts to act weird. One of the big differences with small classes is that the students start to complain that they're always in the same group, oh. which isn't true. Right. But, Statistically That's... speaking, if I'm in a group of three today, if there's 12 students in the class, I'm in a group of three, odds are pretty high that tomorrow, at least one of those people in my group today is going to be in my group tomorrow. Mm. Um, and because of that, the students start to feel like they were always in the same group. Um, when we switch to groups of two, they stop complaining about that. But again, then we run out of we run out of brain pretty fast. So again, we put two groups of two side by side, two groups of two, with small classes. Well, that's fascinating. I I hadn't thought about um, a lower limit. Um, I've taught classes with seven kids in before, and it almost seems like we have to be one big team, yeah, instead of a bunch. But that totally makes sense. That you know, you want to keep that sense of randomization and that sense of culture in your class. And it makes sense that you, you know, there's a lower limit, but no and other I, limit. And that often happens in small classes. They start as groups of two, and then there's just this, this melding over the yeah. course of the lesson. And then by the end, it's just one big group who's who's trying to solve something. But it's yeah. <clears throat> but that only happens if you have done a lot of good work 
to create a community that would foster that. Right? Yeah. I've been in small classes before where the kids are just totally isolated from each other. Right. Right. Well, I, you know, I have some questions that some teachers and some um, admin have asked me to ask you. <laughs> and I know that, uh, like you said, if people have been listening to the podcast, uh, we've been pretty much focused on building thinking classrooms for for the major for the entire year. Yeah. So things have come up. It's really been awesome working with teachers and they try something new and they try something new, right? They start with toolkit one and then they add in a toolkit and then they add in some more layers and things come up that they have really big questions on. So um, I'd like your input on a couple of these mm -hmm. things. One of the things, the, we, these things we've been working a lot, not only in our district, but as you know, the California framework just got adopted. Yeah. Um, and there's a, a huge piece of this on student agency or identity. And we know that that is a, a huge, um, a huge, uh, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, indicator of how students can then be successful in mathematics. Yeah. So the question is, how can um, building a thinking classroom really support student agency and identity in their individual sense of mathematics? Okay. and mathematical identity all right so <clears throat> well there's a couple of things here so agency agency is actually built right into the framework um there is well, practice number eight is all about agency it's about right. the agency that students ac exercise in order to maintain their own engagement and we need to empower students to do that in a thinking classroom because there's too many moving parts if the whole machinery relies solely on the teacher trying to do everything, then it's going to fall apart. So there is that agency. Um, one of the things to understand about agency, though, is that students have always had agency, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they always exercise their agency. Most often, they exercise it by disengaging, hmm. by get, being off task, by not not sort of engaging in the learning with the fidelity that the teacher intends. Um, the biggest source of agency we see is that students exercise their agency around what their goal is. So a vast majority of students have, have goals of getting good grades, passing, flying under the radar. These are, these are goals that students have. They have chosen those goals. Those are not the same as the goal of learning. Hmm. Now, as teachers, we assume or we hope that students have the goal of learning, but they get to decide what their goal is and their goal will dictate how they engage in a lesson, right? If a student's goal is to get good grades, the way they engage in, in, in the lesson is that they only really spike interest and engagement when grades are on the line. If a student's goal is to learn, they are engaged start to finish right? They're exercising their agency. Students have always had agency. And this is one of the things that I think building thinking classrooms is really pushing against is let's try to get them to exercise that agency in more productive ways. Because when we leave it to their own devices, a normative classroom just has too many avenues for students to exercise agency in ways that's detrimental to their own benefit. Yeah. But like I said, practice eight is explicitly about how do we vector that agency towards them self-managing flow and engagement so that so that we can spend more of our time as a teacher dealing with the, the spaces in the room where our attention is needed. <clears throat> so agency has always existed. It exists in how students, whether or not or how they choose to study, complete assignments, uh, listen, take notes, agency is there all the time and students will make bad choices <laughs> yes. and yeah yeah and and the thing about that is that doesn't absolve us of the responsibility of doing a better job just because we gave students an opportunity to learn and they chose not to doesn't actually absolve us of the responsibility of trying to make more engaging more settings more conducive to learn yeah absolutely with regards to identity, again, students always have had identity with mathematics. It's often negative. And that negative uh, relationship they have with, I, with mathematics is often created through some sort of 
apprehension or anxiety around rapid recall and public shaming. Those are those are sort of almost perfectly consistent sources of students' um, disaffection with mathematics. But identity comes in different ways, right? So there's identity as who you are as a person. There's identity in regards to your relationship with mathematics and, and others, right? Your identity in, in your relationship to the, your peers in the classroom, your identity in relationship to your, your teacher, uh, your future plans, and so on. Identity is not some monolithic sort of characteristic like you know right, right. where someone is painted with an identity and that identity is constant no our identity shifts it's yeah. temporal it's situated it's 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 co-constructed in situ with 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 collaborators one of the things that was uh, that i find really interesting is there's a there's a piece of data from surveys with high school students where a whole bunch of high school students are saying, this is the only classroom where I feel like I can be myself. Wow. Now, think about that. Think about the lived experiences of high school students, right? It's so much about projecting a facade, of fitting in, and so on and so forth, of trying to construct an identity that is appealing to peers, and yet here are these students saying, this is the only classroom I feel like I can be myself. I can drop the facade. I can just be me. And just think how safe they must feel in order for that to happen. And where does that safety come from? It comes from community. And that community comes from the random groups. Now, let's talk about relationship with mathematics. So for a long, for, for the last ugh, five years, 10 years, We've been talking a lot about growth mindset and fixed mindset. And these are, these are really huge contributions to the way we think about students in the classroom. But before that, we used to talk about self-efficacy. Hmm. Uh, and we still do talk about self-efficacy, but in some way it's been eclipsed by the growth mindset movement. Self-efficacy, a student's belief in their own ability. And if we want to talk about a relationship with mathematics, an identity around mathematics or mathematical identity, it's much more closely linked to um, self-efficacy. And self-efficacy, my research has shown, is, is, is interesting. Now, self-efficacy has been around forever. Bandura is the seminal contributor to this discourse. But one of the things that we learned in our research, uh, it was an interesting little piece around random groups and how we don't answer questions. Hmm. So these two practices, so practice two and practice five. Okay, so practice two is visibly random groups. Practice five is the way we, we only answer keep thinking questions. We don't hmm. answer their, their proximity questions. We don't answer their stop thinking questions. What do we do instead? We smile and walk away, all right? Now this seems really counter to effective teaching because effective teaching is about being helpful, it's about being nurturing and supportive. And this is almost counter to that. But an interesting thing happens. So I'm, I'm in a classroom and uh, the teacher has started, has been doing this smiling and walking away <clears throat> when the students ask a proximity question or a stop thinking question. So I'm in a classroom, I've kind of immersed myself in a group and I'm just, you know, I'm just participating at, at some level. And uh, the teacher, the student, one of the students calls over the teacher and then they ask them a, a, a stop thinking question. The teacher just smiles and walks away. And I'm like, what is that about? You just asked her a question. She just smiled and walked away. Like, I know what it's about, but they don't. Yeah, know. yeah, right. And one of the kids goes, yeah, she does that a lot. <laughs> I'm like, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that she thinks we can do it on our own. Wow. Well, what do you think? Yeah, we can probably do it on our own. She's been right before, right? Now, so let's think about this experience and let's couple that also with the interview data from students who are in random groups. What do students in random groups say? Like when, after they've been living this experience for a number of weeks, they say things like, my teacher thinks we're all capable. Otherwise they wouldn't do random groups. My teacher mm -hmm. thinks we're all the same. Otherwise she wouldn't do random groups. So self-efficacy is this interesting phenomenon that 
students, it's about the students' beliefs in their own ability. And we know that students often have very negative beliefs about their ability. That's low self-efficacy. And we know that high self-efficacy has a really good correlation with, with student performance and success, right? It's that old Henry Ford adage, whether you think mm -hmm. you can or think you can't, you're right. Yep. Right? So how do we get a student to go from having a low self-efficacy to having a high self-efficacy? Well, our research is, has shown, and I wrote a paper about this recently, is that there are some milestones on this journey from low self-efficacy to high self-efficacy. So before a student can start to believe in themselves, they have to meet a teacher that believes in them. Mm -hmm. So they meet someone who has belief in them, who believes that they are capable. But one of the other things our research showed is that students don't listen to what we say. They listen to what we do. Right. They don't they yeah. don't. And what our actions are much more powerful communicators for the students than our words. So we may say, I believe in you. I think you can do this. But what do our actions say? Right. Because if we're making ability groups, our actions aren't saying that. Right. Even if, our, 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 if we're making mixed ability groups strategically, our actions aren't saying that we believe in them. But what if all of a sudden we're doing random groups and then we smile and walk away? <laughs> what are our actions saying? Our actions are saying, I believe in you. I believe you can do this. Yeah. And that's what the kids are talking about. They're saying that the teacher believes in me. They can hear through the teacher's action that the teachers believe in. That's the first mile marker. The second mile marker is that the students start to believe in the teacher's belief in them. So they're not yet believing in their own ability, but they're believing in the teacher's belief in them. We call that trust. They're mm. starting to trust that if the teacher is asking me to do this, that I'll be able to do it, right? Because the, the teacher has been right before. The teacher, everything that they've asked me to do, I've eventually had success with. Right. And that's something that is true in a thinking classroom framework as well because of the nature of the tasks that we do, the nature of flow where we start with a low floor and we work our way up through progressively increasing complexity and so on and so forth so that the students are starting to trust that the teacher knows their abilities and then eventually they get to the point where they start to believe in their own abilities and that's the high self-efficacy yeah yeah and i know that that um that has a high effect size according to john hattie is one of the highest is student self efficacy and building that self-efficacy uh as you pointed out it really takes trust and we can do that through trust. through those uh through the way that we answer or don't answer questions from the students and yeah. and i remember i you know i just think back in my my career i remember a student um, telling me like i didn't believe i could do this until until you believed that i could do this and, and the student told me that and that's just it's such a powerful state we talk a lot about social emotional learning and and in our classrooms and how can we build those spaces that are safe for kids and um that can be done just by what we do and what we say and it and more what we do up. more more, more what, we, what do. we do than what we say yes yeah. Thank you for that. That's going to be very helpful for a lot of people. So um, this question is probably the 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 most controversial one that that I've had in the last couple of <laughs> of uh, months. Um, so I had we attended the Building Thinking Classrooms conference, and one of the teachers in in a, two podcasts ago, one of the teachers went to a fireside chat, and I know this affects a lot of people out there because uh, I. Once I posted, yeah, I know where this is going. You're, you're laughing already. I posted. I heard that podcast. Yeah, right. I put this podcast up, and then right away there was uh, some fire on our Facebook um, Facebook feed because I know that you know the work of of Fisher and Frey um, on learning intention and success criteria, and a lot of admin, a lot of, uh, around the country, right, different schools are really making this initiative. of making sure that the learning intention success criteria are posted mm -hmm. visible for students. And I know some teachers are going, well, wait a minute, I just heard that maybe they're not supposed to be. So 
I thought I'd ask about some clarification because uh, yeah. I know that I've had admin come to me and like, what's going on with this? So some clarification on, you know, what we can do, especially teachers as they're like, you know, I want to make sure I'm doing what my admin asked me to do. Yep. How can I, how can I do that <laughs> okay. as there's, well as foster some building thinking in my classroom? Okay. So there's, there's, there's a lot to unpack here. All right. <laughs> yeah. So first, um, so what, what we've learned is that, students need to be present, right? They need to be present. They need to feel present when they're engaged in, in learning. And that's, I don't think that's unique to thinking classrooms, but it certainly is important in a thinking classroom that when they're in their group at the whiteboard, that they're feeling present, but they're not feeling the press of other things coming in on it. Well, it turns out that it's impossible for students to feel present if we keep reminding them of the future. Mm. And there are so many things we do in classrooms that remind students of the future. Right? We set a timer. We post an agenda for the lesson. We give them the all 12 questions at once. Right. We <clears throat> we tell them that they're going to have to present to their, their their solution to the class. Like all of these things disrupt students from being present. Right. Because they're all they're thinking about the future. Right. right? So how do we take these things away so that the students can just be present? That doesn't mean that we don't have a timer running, but I'm the one who can see the timer. It doesn't mean that I don't have an agenda. I just haven't published it. It doesn't mean that there aren't 12 questions. I'm just not going to burden them with that. And it doesn't mean that we're not going to look at student work, but I'm not going to have the group present their own solution. I'm going to have other groups, other students try to spot what's going on in their solution. Right. So it's not that these things don't exist in the classroom. It's that we're trying not to burden the students with it so that they can just stay in the present. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, there are other things we do. And one of those is posting the learning intention. Because what is a learning intention, right? A learning intention is about where we want to get to. That's the future, right? And there are really concrete examples that we have where if we were to post the, the learning intention, it would completely destroy the lesson because mm -hmm. either it gives away the ending, which is something right. that we want to get to, or it biases their approach to how to enter the task, which is going to disrupt the natural flow of learning and so on and so forth. Now, there are other times where the learning intention doesn't matter at all. And why doesn't it matter? Because, because A, either the students didn't pay attention to it, you know, like, <laughs> or B, the teacher didn't draw attention to it, or C, the learning intention means nothing to the student, mm. right? Um, so in today's lesson, we're gonna learn how to find the minimum spanning tree of a connected graph. Uh, right? Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so to under, so, and I listened to your podcast and I'm not saying don't post a learning intention. I'm just saying recognize that posting a learning intention can, in certain circumstances, disrupt a student's ability to stay present. Right. Now, I've never been a fan of learning intentions. Does that mean we shouldn't have them? We should definitely have them. <laughs> okay. But I've never yeah. been a fan of it because I am a big proponent of emergent learning. I want mm. the, the, the learning to emerge out of experience. I don't want to give it away. Yeah. Um, but I also recognize that teachers are working in spaces where these things are a required component. Mm -hmm. Now, let's unpack where this comes from. So one of the places it comes from is the UK. So the UK has school inspectors. So school inspectors travel around and they visit classrooms and they evaluate teaching, but they really evaluate schools through teaching. Now, evaluating teaching is difficult. Right. Yeah. Uh, because teaching happens in time, space and relationship. It, it doesn't boil down to simple artifacts. Right. Teaching is very situated and very temporal. So evaluating teaching is difficult. So let's create some things that are easy to evaluate. So mm -hmm. one of the things that they created in the UK that was easy to evaluate was something called the three part lesson. And then they mandated this. The three-part lesson was the in, like, on all lessons have three parts. It's got the intro, it's got the body, it's got the closure. But they sort of structured it like this. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them. Tell them what you told them. Mm -hmm. 
It's yeah. sort of that was sort of the structure of the three part lesson, and this was mandated. So tell them what you're going to tell them. There's the learning intention. Now tell them there's the lesson, and now tell them what you told them. There's a closing, right? And this was mandated, and a learning intention being posted on the whiteboard became a really easy way to all of a sudden assess teaching on the assumption that this is a good framework of teaching, right? So that's one of the places it came from. The second place it came from was that the U.S. loves to evaluate teachers. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and you need to understand that that is a uniquely American phenomenon. Oh, that's interesting. That you are evaluating teachers a lot and often, um, way more than any other place I've ever, I've ever been. Wow. Um, and again, we're back to this idea of evaluating teaching and evaluating teaching is difficult. So let's pick some things that are easy to evaluate. Did they have they posted the learning intention? Did they point to it? Did they read it three times that, at the beginning of the lesson? Right. Like, again, does do I want teachers to have a learning intention? Absolutely. I want you to have a learning intention. Yeah. But we can be really disruptive with this. Or not, we can post it on the board. Don't point at it. Don't talk about it. The kids won't notice it. Change it once a week in case an administrator walks in, right? Like, like there's <laughs> yeah. that approach too, which isn't necessarily what what they're looking for either. Right. Um, now, the third place learning intentions comes from is this, this research that shows that when students understand where they are and where they're going, they can be much better partners in learning. Mm -hmm. They have they have more ability to navigate their own learning. Right. And this is absolutely true. This is my chapter 13 and 14 in my book. John yes. has talked about this in his research. And I totally agree with that. Now, let me ask you this. Today, we're going to learn how to do a minimum spanning tree of a minimum of a connected graph. Does that tell you where you are? Um. It tells me I have no idea what you said. Right. So it doesn't, and it doesn't even tell you where you're going. No. Right. So because so I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any context to know where I'm going because I have no idea what you talked about. Right. Right. Yeah. And this is one of the problems is like, in order for this to be in fact effective, students have to understand where they are, and putting a learning intention does none of that. Hmm. And it also has to help them understand where they're going. And unless they have it, and here's a catch-22. In order to understand the learning intention, we have to already have experienced some of the learning intention. Mm. So this starts to make sense when we're, say, halfway through a unit. And all of yeah. a sudden, the teacher at the beginning of the lesson says, so up until today, we've been really focused on uh, doing operations on fractions where we've had common denominators. And if we think back to Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, you could see how we were always doing that. Going forward today, we're going to start to look at what happens if the denominator is different. Mm, now, and that 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 actually starts to um, spur curiosity. Yes. Like I could see kids going, "Oh, that I'm interested in now. What's going on?" Right. But notice what's happening here. I know where I am, mm -hmm. and I know where I'm going. Because mm. And I can only understand this because I've already been on the journey for a while. Mm. And if you read my chapter 13, you start to understand that that's exactly what's happening in chapter 13, right? And chapter 14. And what John Hattie's work is showing is that learning intentions and success criteria is, are, are really powerful for student um, performance, achievement, learning. Mm -hmm. But there's caveats to this. And one of them is, the, A, they got to understand what the fraction you're talking about. <laughs> right. And B, they have to have some sense of where they themselves are in this journey. Uh, and so it starts to make sense if, for example, we talk about at the end of the lesson. So today, we learned how to factor quadratics. Where, But if we look closely at it, we notice that they were always of the type where the x squared was by itself there was nothing in front of the x squared there was no leading coefficient right right we we've 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 done those when we had negative signs here we had negative signs there but always the x squared was a one x squared right and then at the beginning of the next lesson we might say so remember yesterday 
Mm -hmm. What we did was, well, today we're going to start to explore what happens if that leading coefficient is like a 2x squared, right? Like, do you see how this is shifting here? And none of that is attainable by reducing the complexity of teaching and learning to something as simple as state your learning intention. Right. And link it to a standard. Right. right. So today we're going to learn about SE1034, <laughs> which... I think you got to be like Inspector Gadget to decode that, <laughs> right? So, like, it's. I'm not saying we shouldn't have learning intentions. I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about learning intentions. I'm just saying that if we want to talk about learning intentions, let's actually make them powerful. Yeah, they're more powerful if we talk about them at the end of the lesson. Now they're not learning intentions; they're learning outcomes. And as we're partway through the journey and we've sort of seen everything a little bit, we can start to pull together the picture of where they are in this journey and where they need to go as through self-assessment. Hmm. Now, what if you're a teacher working in a setting where it's mandated that you have to post a learning intention? Right. Well, you have, you have no power in this space, right? Like you have no power. Um, if you want to gain some power, if you truly believe that this is important and you want to gain some power, you have to sh you have to stop talking about what it is that you're supposed to do and you have to shift the conversation to what it is that they want you to achieve hmm. right because in a situation where you're talking about what it is you're being told what to do you have no power but what is it you want me to achieve with this you're starting to have power right hmm. so if 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 an administrator says i want to see a learning intention on the board say okay what is it you want that to achieve and if they say I, I want students to know what they're learning. I can do that. I can promise you that I can do that. Mm. Now, but I'm going to do it different. Let, give, me a, give me three weeks, come back and watch, and I'll show you that I can do that a different way. Right? Mm -hmm. But that assumes, A, that you, you agree with what I said. <laughs> right. B, that, that it's important to you. And C, that... This is actually something you're willing to butt heads a little bit with. Mm. Um, like I said, the easiest thing to do is just put a learning intention on the board. Don't talk about it. Don't point at it. Change it once a week. And then have a really rich conversation at the end of the lesson. Mm. All right. Well, I think that's going to help a lot of people out there. And I know uh, we're coming to the end here. I've got one more important question. It was on the Facebook group. And um, I told them I'd, I'd ask you. Um, and I, I actually have some teachers in that I work with that also in this situation, they have students that, that are in wheelchairs or mm -hmm. need accommodation. They have a special desk. What accommodations do we make for those those students? What are some suggestions that you have? Um, so the very first thing with any accommodations is you have to be very careful to not other the learner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because um, they're aware of they're the situation aware. too. But they also don't want to be othered often. Right. They right. want to, they, they're trying very hard to fit in and we need to respect their wishes. What I always recommend to a teacher is when you have a student who needs an accommodation, whether that is a student in a wheelchair, a student with, who's living with dwarfism, a student who has mobility issues or balance issues, uh, whatever sort of physical challenges that they're living with, that is going to make it more difficult for them to interact in a thinking classroom in the way that it's just set up for everybody else. Mm -hmm. The first thing to do is have a conversation with them. Um, yeah. What can I do to help you here? I'll give you an example. I was working with a teacher who had a student who lives with dwarfism. She goes, I want to lower some of my boards. I go, are you sure that that's what the student wants? Mm. Right? Like, are you sure you want to have a lower board just for them? Because that's very othering. Yeah. Why don't you have a conversation with him and see what it is that he wants? So she comes back. She says, yeah, he was fine. He doesn't need an accommodation at all. He says, I can't write at the top of the board, but I can write in the bottom half. I'm good with that. Yeah. Right? Like, and same, that's true of a student with a wheel in a wheelchair. That's, that's true of so many different things. Start with a, uh, a conversation. If the student says, I'd really like to have access to a lower whiteboard, then lower three of them. Or don't even lower them, just extend them. So that mm -hmm. you have one wall has whiteboards that go from floor to floor up to regular height. And then 
you can just sort of rig it in such a way that the student always ends up in one of those groups. But start by talking to the student. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great advice. I think we always try to come up with solutions before we ask the student what they think the solution might right. be. And of course, that comes from a place of good. Yeah, right? we're absolutely, trying to absolutely. support them. Um, but we always have to always juxtapose that against othering. Because yeah. a lot of students who and, and not just students, but people in general, who who live with atypical are they want to they are they want to be seen like everybody else and indeed they should be there is uh, you know th they're in a wheelchair that doesn't change anything else about who they are right absolutely yeah all right any last thoughts for our listeners out there any last thing you want to say um i've been saying this a lot lately building thinking classrooms is not some dance to which only Peter knows the choreography, right? Building thinking classroom is a problem to solve. Work it like a problem. Find some collaborators, start working the problem, see if you can figure it out. And it's not that I'm trying to withhold information, it's just that every situation is different. Our goal is, our, our goal is simple. We wanna get students to think. That's gonna look different in different settings. But, and, and building thinking classrooms, the book, gives you some a head start on that gives you some insight into 14 practices but each of those needs micro moves that 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 you can craft yourself excellent well thank you so much for joining me i really appreciate it um i know the teachers out there the admin the board i, I have a few board members that listen to it um i think that this is going to help just move us in a direction that i really feel we need to be moving in mathematics education. So I appreciate the conversation. Again, everybody, Peter Lilladal, did I say that right? Pretty good. Pretty good. I swear I'm gonna get closer. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna get better as, as time goes on. It's one of the uh, mysteries of, of building thinking classrooms. There you go, there you go. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And I again, I really appreciate it. My pleasure, thanks for having me.